Okay, ready? Ready. Let me, let me know. Okay. Welcome back to Spartan Up Podcast. Here we are in Boston. And uh, reflecting back on some of our earlier podcasts, one of the first really big name ones was Richard Branson. That was a big one. That was, I think it was number one. I think yeah. that was the first one. Incredible. And, and I don't want to say that it, uh, big names equate with great interviews. That one was a great interview. A lot of people have been introduced to people through this podcast have been awesome. But we're going back to the Branson well because uh, Sam Branson, his son, Noah Devereaux, his nephew, two really interesting guys that you got to talk with. Yeah, no, it was awesome. I think, um, listen, obviously big names. People love to uh, track what Richard's doing. So I think they're going to get a real kick out of this and see uh, the Branson family now, right? Maybe from another light. We are here for Spartan Up Podcast with Noah Deverex. Did I say that right? You did. Uh, Richard Branson's nephew. Your mom is Richard's sister. She is. And uh, was she, did she grow up the same way? When I, when I interviewed Richard, he had said that at one point, I think he was just dropped off and had to like make his own way home. Was, was, did she go through the same kind of thing? Yeah, they had quite a unique upbringing, I think. Um, mom was the youngest by about 10 years. And so I think by the time she was growing up, my grandparents, her parents, had basically given up on parenting. And so they would literally go off on holiday and leave mum when she was seven or eight to, to fend for herself, <laughs> make her own dinner and put herself to bed and sometimes even take her to school. <laughs> so, yeah. Where, where was that? That was yeah. in Surrey in the south of London. Nice. Literally on her own, seven, eight basically years old. Basically on her own, yeah. Sometimes she'd wake up and her parents wouldn't be there. And I think there was one awful story where her parents were away on a summer holiday and her horse died. And she had to deal with her horse's death. Like, emotionally, that was quite a traumatic thing. And then she had to deal with, the, like, the body getting removed from the house. By herself. Like, by herself, aged 10 or 11. 11. Or something really young. But isn't that what makes you... I mean, that, that we, I think about it a lot. I have four children. And, and most parents out there think about it. You want to... You want to fend for the kid. You want to, right? Because instinctually, you want to do the right thing and make sure they're protected. But, but at the same time, what you just described probably makes them better. Mm. Makes us better people. One hundred percent. I think there's a real trend towards mollycoddling people yeah. um, in the twenty first century, and I think it's. I, I don't think it's a good thing. Me, for example, when I was younger, my mom was always encouraging me to leap off the higher cliff if we were on holiday and we we're doing cliff jumps, and I'd huh. be at the top saying, "Mom, I'm really scared." Just like, oh, put yourself together. And she has her famous expression is it's just wind on the skin. So when you're cold, we'd be we'd be little kids moaning about being cold. And she's like, just pull yourself together. It's wind on the skin, and you get that sort of jolt from your parents, and you realise that actually, if it doesn't kill you, it genuinely does make you stronger. Um, and I think that's being lost on younger generations. Is that part of the reason you guys came up with uh, big change? Yeah. So um, I actually personally didn't come up with big change, um, but big change was set up by Holly and Sam in 2012 to look at the way charity was being done and to try and do it differently. Tell uh, the audience who Holly and Sam are. Um, Holly and Sam are my cousin's um, daughter and son of, of Sir Richard Branson. Um, so obviously they have shaking things up and disrupting systems in their blood, and that's what we're trying to do with Big Change, but just in the charity sector. And it started when? started in 2012. Um, Holly, Sam, and a number of other people, well, 34 to be precise, ran the London Marathon tied together as a caterpillar. They broke a world record um, for running a marathon tied, tied to a group of people. And they raised about £300,000. And that money was then divided between 12 different charities. And a year following it, they went back and spoke to the 12 different charities. Not a single one could tell them or demonstrate the impact that had been created by, how that, by the money that was raised. Sure. And they thought that that was, that was bad, basically. And they looked around the table and realised with their shared resource and passion, they could create something that was really cool. Um, and so Big Change was born. And so how many people work for Big Change now? It's a small team. Um, there's five of us that work for it full time. And then we have a number of different people that work um, on various projects and consult to us and, and work with us across the spectrum of support that we give our projects. So Big Change essentially applies a venture capital model to the world of philanthropy. So we're looking for the best, most innovative, really early stage organizations and projects that we think have the potential to scale and affect change on a national, national level. Um, and so it's a really exciting model. I think one of the big problems in the UK, traditionally in the charity sector, has been charity funders don't look for risk, they look for safe bets. Right. And that has led to um, some great organisations. I, I would never criticise people um, for what, doing what they're doing, because some people are doing great things. But the same people doing the, 
same things over and over. Because in order to prove your impact, you have to be funded. In order to get funding, you have to be able to prove your impact. So it means that there's been no space for, for new ideas and new interventions and new supports to rise up and, and help. help kind of like politics. Yeah, I suppose. In a way, right? <laughs> exactly. So, we try and remain agnostic on politics. So, so give us some, some examples of some funding you're doing, some projects you're focused on. Um, really great example is an organization called Frontline. Um, we supported them when they were two people in the business plan and their mission I suppose is to do for social work what Teach First um, did for teaching and it, essentially it takes the best um, graduates from university and puts them into positions within the social work sector which initially caused some, some criticism because people were saying why are you giving these great graduates who have got opportunities all over the place, positions in social work, but actually that's a little bit short-sighted because when you've got great people in important roles, the whole sector is going to benefit. Um, so we supported them in 2012 when they were literally a business plan. They have since been able to scale and attracted tens of millions of pounds worth of investment wow. from the government this year. And so literally in the space of four years, they've gone from an organisation with two people, they've now got 30 full-time employees, and by 2020, they're going to be touching 25% of young people's lives in the country that they could be. So wow. it's a pretty impressive... So, so you're basically taking the best of the best talent and bringing them over to do good. Exactly. Right, yeah. get them out of the private sector where they're naturally their tendencies would be going towards. Precisely. So Singapore, I just moved to Singapore with my family, and mm -hmm. uh, very similar thing. They, they, they bring the best and brightest and try to motivate them to come into politics mm -hmm. because, because that's where you could make a big impact, yeah, exactly. hopefully in a positive way. Why would you, why would you not want the best and brightest yeah. there? Exactly, so. and I think there's a remarkable and very, very wholesome trend in this day and age of millennials wanting to do good. I think there are some amazing stats around young people or early 20-somethings not looking for financial incentive in their roles, their jobs. They're looking to, to make, do good, to make a positive to make an change. Impact. Not everybody wakes up in the morning and wants to create big change, right? Mm -hmm. not, most people are so focused, they're in their cubicles, their lives are uh, uh, monotonous um, every day. They're not necessarily motivated. W what do you think gave you, Sam, your cousins, that, that drive? Where did that come from? Could, by the way, it might not even come from families that have mm -hmm. done as well as mm -hmm. uh, your predecessors have, have done, right? Yeah. Typically, you might not be motivated. For sure. And I think, I mean, it's the easy answer, right? I think that motivation has definitely come from, from our family. Um, so my grandmother, who gave my mother like a slightly strange upbringing, was constantly striving to improve the lives of other people, whether that was on like a community level, and she's now 93 and she runs um, an organization called the Eve Branson Foundation in Morocco. And she's 93, she's got the most unbelievable energy and need to change the world around her. And that definitely has come down through the generations, starting with her, obviously Richard is quite a well-known philanthropist, do good, I wants to change everything around him. Um, and I think that's trickled through. And actually I was, I was listening to Tony Robbins' podcast the other day, um, I've only just come across him, amazing guy. And he was saying that the key to a fulfilled and happy life it's down to two things, and that's growth and giving. And that really resonated with me really strongly because um, with big change and with Strive, that's essentially what we're trying to achieve. Um, and growth, so, growth and giving. Growth yeah. and giving. Yeah. So a participant will come and take part in the Strive Challenge, and it is a Strive. You're meant to be pushing yourself. You're meant to be right in the envelope of what's possible for you. And when you're in that place, you genuinely do discover stuff that you didn't know about yourself. It's incredible for your self-confidence. You meet remarkable people around you. And when you're striving alongside other people, you, the relationships that are formed in that moment in time are really remarkable. They're un unbreakable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No, I so, went through the same experience, which is, which is how Spartan was born. So mm, um, mm. we're doing the same thing with, with yeah. barbed wire and walls and, <laughs> and fire. <laughs> yeah. so. Well, I mean, we're actually looking to... Um, to so we, every other year we do a big mass participation, multidiscipline, ultra endurance event. Sure. Um, so the first one we did was London to the Matterhorn under human power. Nice. This summer, or this September, we're doing the Matterhorn to Mount Etna in Sicily, so it's a continuation. But then every other year we're going to do a smaller event in the UK 
Um, and we're actually looking at models to... Yeah. Um, to well, that, you should talk so. to the Spartan people. Yeah, we will be. <laughs> I, know, I know them pretty well. <laughs> yeah. so, so with Spartan Race, you try and instill Spartan-like qualities into your yes, race. Yes, yes. I mean, and that's the whole idea behind the podcast and everything mm. we do is, is uh, how do you get out of your comfort zone? How do you push your limits? How do you do it with other people? Um, yeah. But really, it's about transformation and growth. Yeah. I remember when uh, we took in some private equity investors, they couldn't really understand this idea that the brand was about transformation, about mm. becoming a better person. Mm. Um, but really, if you ask, we have a million participants a year, if you ask them, what did you get out of it? It wasn't so much that they could run a little faster or they could yeah. climb a wall better. It was that now they look at life differently, mm. right? Kids screaming, no big deal, car doesn't start, not a problem, cold coffee or no coffee, Yeah, I don't mind. Yeah. I was going to say, and actually, there's, I, I, we, you can't expect people to be able to transform the world around them if they haven't experienced a personal That's transformational right. growth. And so right. it has to start from within. It has to start with you yourself. Um, and then the, so that the ripple effect starts from there. And so I love what you guys are doing. We're trying to do a similar thing with Strive. And I think it should not be underestimated just the almost like the meditative state that you're able to get into in the wilderness. It's not like meditation and it's what people know it to be, but it's just so relaxing and calming and you're not being bombarded, like I was saying, by just constant, um, I don't know, pressures from magazines and body image issues and like, I don't know, fear that your friends are having more fun when they're not with you because they're doing X, Y, and Z. I'm not sure, I don't know. I, I see it in young people and I, I'm very pleased for myself that I was brought up just before the social media explosion. Yeah. So I went, I went to school and I didn't have to deal with any of that. Which I, um, my wife uh, made the decision that the kids were going to have iPads, which has worked out in Singapore because the mm. schools actually use the iPads for mm. teaching. But there's some games on there, Minecraft and so forth, sure. that are extremely addictive, frustratingly yeah. addictive yeah. for the kids. And I take the iPads away every once in a while. And when I do, there's definitely this hour that goes by where there's like um, some shaking going on, yeah, right? And the kids yeah. are stressed out. But then before you know it, they're looking for a basketball or a soccer yeah, ball yeah. or a rugby ball and they're outside and they're swimming and yeah. back to the way. Mm. Certainly I grew up where there was nothing, but like yeah. we got to go outside and build something. Exactly. Do something. I was going to say, when I was growing up, my mom would allow us to watch an hour of television or two hours of television a week and that was before breakfast on a Saturday and Sunday morning. And the rest of it, we had to be outside. We had to be creating things um, really importantly. I think young people are losing the ability and also the desire just to build stuff and create stuff and climb a tree. It sounds so simple and people have banged on about it, but I genuinely think that there is something magical about climbing a tree. I mean, young people are losing even the, the desire to do so. And that, and that, connection, that connection with nature. Mm. Yeah. All right, we are here for Spartan Up Podcast with Sam Branson, Richard Branson's son. As you know, we've interviewed Richard Branson before, so I thought it would be interesting to find out, did the apple fall far from the tree? Amazing, you're in this office, you're working really hard. Most young people coming from, from that um, kind of privilege wouldn't be uh, going after it. Tell me a little bit about your childhood. Like, how, how, did, how did you end up here? Um, yeah, so... Uh I think, as you know, my dad's a bit of an adventurer in and, and business and life, and, and so adventure's always been a big part of my life growing up. And so I remember, you know, being a kid, and, you know, if we were going to lunch, we would end up taking the strange route through the trees and then ending up at lunch four hours too late, but having an amazing time doing it. And I suppose that's sort of a, a, a little example of our life growing up. And Well, usually, <laughs> I've had friends arrive there, and, 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 you know, we've had a few drinks, it's dinner, and it's pitch black, and he goes, who wants to sail around the island? And you're like, hold on a minute, all these guys have come from England and then you hop on the boats, there's no light and you're going around the island at night. And, you know, I mean, I think, I think something that's rubbed off from him on us is just that, you know, you always have a choice in any moment whether to do something that's exciting or not. And if every time that you choose to go and do something exciting, you always end up having those great memories that you wouldn't have normally had. You have a better life. Yeah, or, or it ends quickly. Yeah, well, right. not, not yet, not yet. Right. And I haven't done a death race That's yet. Right. Maybe when we do the death race, we'll see. <laughs> so um, tell us about Strive, Strive Challenge. Um, so Strive is probably the thing that I'm most proud of in my life. Uh -huh. um, it's sort of born out of um, my own personal experience. You know, growing up uh, in my situation, I was very lucky. But um, like most young men, I did a bit of soul searching yeah. And, uh, and in my early 20s, I had the opportunity to go to the Arctic on a 1,400-mile, a three-month dog sled expedition. Nice. 
Uh, and that trip really sort of enabled me to break myself down, build myself back up again. Uh, it gave me those life skills that I needed to thrive, like emotional resilience, teamwork, communication skills. And also gave me that sort of confidence and, and, and self-learning. So I wanted to come up with a challenge that gave other people that sense of experiential learning. Yeah. Um, and so people in their day-to-day life who don't get to go on these big adventures, what, what, what's, what's the vehicle in which they can go and challenge themselves, be a part of a big adventure? And so Strive was born uh, with my cousin Noah, and really it's an opportunity to get people out there and, and pushing themselves and um, also raising funds synergetically for young people out there who are going through... In the process. Yeah, yeah. and they, they're going through their challenges every day, but they're metaphorical mountains. So. Tell us about the 1,400-mile um, the dog sled run. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it was a pretty amazing experience. I got out there and uh, we did a first training ride and... You know, I just, I had a massive reality check and I was like... Did oh. you, did you, how long were you with the dogs to get to know the dogs? Uh, we did like a, a week's training right. um, and that's when I did this training ride and, um, <laughs> and it was freezing. Did you have dog cold. food? Yeah, dog food with you, I hope. dog food, yeah, not for us. <laughs> um, but then I, I just, I just realized, oh my God, you've got three months of this, what the hell are you going to do? And so right. I sort of took a look in the mirror and I just said, whatever you do, you just embrace the ups and the downs of this experience. And yeah. it's as soon as I took that perspective, it enabled me to really enjoy it. Um, and no matter what the trip threw at me, I just saw it as one long journey and learning experience, and that really enabled me to enjoy the trip. And um, I did something kind of similar in Alaska, a mm-hmm. dog, dog sled run. Um, Not the uh, Ditterod. The Ditterod, but we did, did it by, it. we did it by foot. And, uh, wow. and um, I won't fly over Alaska anymore. My experience was so tough. Oh, really? So I, don't know okay, how, cool. I don't know how you feel about the Antarctic. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, for me, it's, I've got a love affair with it because right. it was, I, I would say it was the making of me, I think. Um, you know. All right, I want to go back to the Antarctic trip. There had to be something that went wrong. Um, so it was the Arctic, but yeah, yeah. so uh, it was a pretty hairy experience, and excuse the pun, yeah. uh, but we, uh, we were in this rough sea ice, so the year before there had been so much breakup of ice, we were basically travelling in ice boulders, the height of the ceiling, and uh, we were going through this stretch, and it basically had to get out the, the, the ice axes and chop our way through, and it took us about three days to move about 40 yards. Wow. And we were in there, and then the weather closed in, and we were running out of our food supply, and there was n- so it was all foggy, and the planes can come in to resupply us and we actually had to debate whether we were going to eat one of the dogs and then we had this kind of funny but then kind of quite serious talk about which dog we would eat that's what i was, was going to say how do you, yeah, how do you choose which dog was it the, was it well, the slowest I, I knew which dog i wanted to eat because it was the one i didn't like the most <laughs> right. but uh, the, um, the owners obviously were right. with us on the sleds and it became quite heated and it was one of those very surreal moments where you're on these challenges and 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 the crap hits the fan and you go yeah. okay right it, you come down to really primal basic right. things it's like if you need to survive you need to gonna eat the do dog. something that's hardcore and and luckily the weather cleared up and we got our resupply in but you know you that dog you, didn't know how close he was he didn't know how close <laughs> I, I, I mean i don't know if i could have done it but but wait i just in those moments where you, you push yourself out there there's these things that make you realize that it comes about survival yeah. and i think that's when you really feel the most human is right. when, you, when you're in the survival no doubt. mode not just experience when you cross over that just yeah. over that line a little bit and right thank god i didn't have to eat a dog because i love dogs <laughs> i know i love dogs i'm a, I'm a but yeah, it, it's it was, between you and the dog. Yeah, <laughs> the exactly. dog's going. Oh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Fine, fine by me. I've, been, I've got a loving parents and an amazing life. I'm very, very lucky. But until I did that thing that that really took me out of my comfort zone and gave me that sense of identity, that 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 you learn the most by yourself when you're when you when you really break yourself down and you have to dig deep. It's a rite of passage yeah. that doesn't exist anymore for young people in, yeah. in the developed world, right? Well, you need to go and actively seek you gotta it. Go, you got to go seek it, yeah. And so that's what Strive is. Strive is creating that rite mm-hmm. of passage for people. Yeah, and I think it's a big challenge and people can jump in for a couple of days so it's accessible sure. in that way. Mm-hmm. And, um, and striving, you know, the word strive is all about just getting out there and being positive and doing what you can. So. Pushing yourself past your limits. Yeah. With what we do, it's, it's actually the people that come into it who aren't sure or the ones that are struggling the most that actually end up getting the most out of it. Oh, no doubt. It's, yeah. It's, uh, but it's, it's, it's great. Like, as, as both of us are, uh, sing from the same hymn book. It's, uh, That's right. But it's, but it's hard. I don't know if you experience it. It's very hard to get people convinced. Like, 
you would think that triple type A personalities out of, bi- you know, running businesses or whatever would be the first ones to jump over. They're not. Mm. Surprise, oh, they're not in shape. They're not ready. They're not. It's always an excuse. Yeah, and, and it's surprising to me because you would think those guys and girls would jump over right away. Mm. They don't. It's, yeah. it's, um, Signing up's the hardest part. Just say yes. That's right. And then you've got to do what you've got to do to get there. Yeah. Um, I used to just say yes, just not even knowing what it was because it's just easier that way, right? Now, yeah. you're, now you're committed. You're on the hook. Oh, cool. I, I'm going to do that. We can start, start, I've got some plans. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. I lost my microphone again. Getting people to sign up to these challenges is, is, is you know, for the people who are interested in it, who've had these experiences before, yep. they know what they're going to gain from it. They know that how, you know how much fun it's going to be, what they're going to learn. But it's for the people who would never normally do a trip like this that I think get the most out of it. And just trying to convince them to sign up. And, you know, from the trips I've done, what I've learned about myself, like the life skills that I've got, like emotional resilience, teamwork, communication skills, the sense of confidence, sense of identity. These are just fundamental building blocks to having a successful life. And, And after the trips that I've done... It's just helped me with my work life, my personal life, my family life. Yeah. Um, and so for to take people who aren't normally sort of acclimatized to doing these experiences and giving them that learning and seeing them grow as an individual by the time they finish, just it's just the best. Very, very re- rewarding. Yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. I take it one step further, cold showers, burpees in the morning, all kinds yeah. of things, because we can't live in the Antarctic every yeah. day, right? Yeah. So i got to recreate it. Well, we could, but it might be yeah. <laughs> yeah. different sort of life. Uh, your wife might not like it. No, so. <laughs> she certainly wouldn't like it. <laughs> Let's talk about kids. Mm. So you just had a daughter. I've got a beautiful little daughter called Eva Dea, uh, who's 14 months old. Nice. Um, who's, I can see she's got uh, her father's adventurous bug. She's... <laughs> She, right. If you put her in a room, she can't sit still until she's seen every single corner of it. Nice. Uh, and it's great. She's got, she, you can see she's got that explorative um, sort of DNA in her. And, you know, and having learned the most about myself doing my challenges. Sure. I can't wait to sort of do see, see where she's going to go. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and, and put her outside her comfort zone. It's one of the things we talk about a lot is um, it's going to be in your instinct. I, we have four children now to protect that mm. child, mm. right, and and not have anything in harm's way mm. uh, go get near her. Yeah. But yet the opposite is what makes her grow. It's a fine <laughs> line, man. Right? I, mean, I totally get it. I'm, I mean, my anxiety level has definitely gone up since I had a kid because sure. obviously suddenly you become more protective of yourself. Like when we did Strive last time, I was climbing the Matterhorn and my wife was pregnant and yeah. someone died the week before we set off. I'm on the side of this mountain and right. getting altitude sickness and suddenly this whole element of fear comes in that you don't normally have. And sure. I think managing fear is so important. But, you know, my dad pushed me and my sister to do exciting and Thanks. adventurous things. Uh, so I want to do that with my daughter, but also you've got to be careful because you're there. You can push too protector, far. Protect her, so you've just got to get that fine line. Right. You know, I, I, I agree. I think in the modern world, there is everything is done for you on tap if you want it to some extent. You know, sure. the basics. And I think you, you know, you and I both know that it's those times where you feel we are animals. Really, we're just we're meant to be out there doing cool okay. stuff. We are animals. Ourselves being physical and I told you that yeah. <laughs> we're animals. <laughs> she said, "I'm not a dog." Uh, I said, "Why not? <laughs> you're, you're a human animal." Um, well, take that which way you want. You know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no. Look, I think I think it's unnatural for us to sit down all day and not communicate with people, not get out there, push ourselves, and and look. I think sometimes when I'm working hard and. I just think, what's wrong? Something's wrong. And I, do, I can't work out what it is, and I realize I haven't exercised for three weeks. Right. Getting out there, doing exercise, and pushing myself is what really sort of gives me that life energy. No, no doubt about it. I make my kids, um, you'll get a kick out of this. I, um, we, we were lucky enough, we got a kung fu instructor to move in with us. That sounds pretty badass. Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, I, I knew you'd like it. You're, you'll probably get one now for your daughter. And um, the kids, for the last four years, seven days a week, two a days, have done Kung Fu. Well, that, I mean, that's also like just apply, a- applying themselves and seeing themselves grow. Like so many kids, they have this sort of fixed mindset where they do something, if they try the Kung Fu and they're not very good, they just go, oh, I'm not very Drop good out. at it. Yeah. And it's scary the amount of children today who are brought up in an environment where they just think that's their ceiling. Whereas a growth mindset, the thing that you learn through doing these challenges that we're talking about, right. is all about, you know, application, you push yourself, you just you don't have a ceiling on your growth. The more you apply yourself, the better. So your kids are loving it now because they've seen how good they can That's right. You know? And, and um, I don't know if you know this, but there have been studies done. Uh, there's a woman named Angela Duckworth, works at the University of Pennsylvania, who's the expert, preeminent expert on, on the growth mindset. And um, almost every human being, when you ask them how far you can go, will shortchange themselves. 
Yeah. Almost everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so um, people and kids need to be shown, no, you, you, I, had a, I had a group of 300 kids in a school in Singapore. How many burpees? Oh, we could do 20. We could do 30. We did 300 burpees together. Wow. Right? But it, 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 it's no problem. We could do 5,000 together, right? Would you, you just get through it somehow. It might yeah. take a while. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah. Um, but it was amazing to see the light bulbs go off mm. in the kids' head. That, oh, wait a minute, I can go a lot further mm. than I thought I could. But they don't get that opportunity very often. Well, they don't try. But that's, I, right. I always say to people, when you, when you feel like your tank's empty, you're still half full. Right. You just need to learn how to tap into it. And that's all up here. Yeah. Okay, welcome back. Um, Noah, I love what you guys are doing with Strive. And, uh, you know, I had the, the pleasure of working for the Branson family on their island a couple summers ago and got to meet a whole bunch of the, the different parts of the family. And all of them, including his family, are just the most generous, good-hearted, fun people. Their, their grandmother, she's... She, like, couldn't be stronger and more active and moving and, like, writes every day and just has this great personality. And you can really see where these genetics come from. It's kind of this, uh, this family of adventure, I, I, really. I, 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 I'm going to throw in a, a, a nurture versus nature argument, too, because it, a lot of it has to do with just the environment they're growing up in. And one thing I found pretty neat to, to listen to them is sharing some of the, the challenges, some of the decisions along the way, the fear of leaving a business to start something else. And, you know, we sort of assume that because they, um, you know, have this pedigree that life's pretty easy. And, uh, and yet they, they're still out there trying to find ways to stretch themselves and, and dealing with the problems just like anyone else does. Well, I, I, think, I think they've been taught the responsibility of money, essentially, right? The philanthropy part of it. Yeah. So clearly they could be doing things, but it doesn't look like that's the way they were raised, right? There, there are, there are, uh, they have responsibilities and there's expectations and they should, and, and they're, they're doing well to help others that, that are less fortunate, essentially. Yeah. You know, it's always nice to see, right? Because they don't have it's, to. It's phenomenal. Yeah. You know, it's great because again, there's, there's many more who don't than do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now to go back though very quickly on a grandmother, I don't know if it's the same grandmother uh, that he was talking about well, one of those grandmothers needed to be in jail, right? <laughs> no. I, I mean, leaving a seven-year-old at home for a week, and then the horse dies, and it was up to the seven-year-old to get the horse buried? Gets you, uh, it gets it, you it, tougher. Uh, <laughs> it, get, it gets you jail time in the United States. No, yeah. but when I, when I interviewed uh, Richard way back when, for those of you who haven't seen that podcast, roll back and take a look at it. But um, he talked about one of the reasons he was um, who he is now is because his mother and father dropped him off to... Right, that would be the grandmother. The grandmother, that, that, right, that same grandmother. But, that you yeah, have I mean, so, so, I mean, it obviously it worked. I'm just, but, yeah. Fortunately, there is a statute of limitations. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, what I can say about this is, I mean, this family is a lovely family that doesn't take any sort of privilege with, with any um, grain of salt or anything. What, what they do is they try to say, how can we make a big change? How can we use our influence and who we are to make the biggest impact we can? And what they are all consistently doing is finding what they're passionate about and transforming that into a way to raise money or to do causes like big change that can um, really help and uh, affect lots of people. And so what I love to see about them is, you know, their conversations are all very like progressive and proactive in, in how they can be just positive role models and doing amazingly massive and big things for the world. And so what I liked what he said is, all right, we're in a job, but then this is something you're passionate about. I love how him and Sam had like that serendipity of having that same sort of idea. It's kind of clues you into, like, hey, this is great. Let's go for it. And then um, London to Matterhorn. Yeah, I, I love. I, just, I mean, be, biking. I just want to mention the noise is, oh, that, yeah, is, is right. because we're at Brooklyn Boulders and they're climbing and there's a bunch of kids screaming. Awesome. Um, See, they're they're, they're striving. The they're striving to go higher. Well, that that actually yeah. that actually uh, is, is kind of a good segue to into something else that uh, I think it was uh, Noah said when he talked about um, that most kids have got two hours of TV under their belt uh, before breakfast. And, you know, the idea about get out there and, sorry, what were you going to say? No, no, I think what he said was he was only allowed to watch two hours of TV on Saturdays before breakfast. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, but, 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 but the idea that so many kids are just sitting watching TV all day, every day, instead of being here at Brooklyn Boulders or out in a tree or in the water doing something amazing. And the idea about, uh, what was it, wind on skin. Yeah, I, lo- I love the wind on skin. It's like, get out and experience nature. And he says, 
find what you love and then do it and then stick with it. The stick with it's the hard part. And they're saying, um, you know, do what you're passionate about because people follow passion. And that family is all about passion. It's just an energy you want to be around because it just it just sucks you in, you know? Even like you, your, like even, your energy, well, Carl. I don't know my energy, but I'm thinking about <laughs> uh, a guy who went sailing. And I don't know how much sailing experience you had uh, no, before you, have, jumped, on, have, before much, you jumped on that boat. I jumped in because I like adventure. I mean, all the things we've been talking about throughout all these podcasts, right? You don't get outside your comfort zone, you don't grow. So to be out on a sailboat with Richard in a storm where he was being advised by all the experts yeah, not, not to, to go, go out there, right? yeah. you got you to do it. But, that, that, I mean, that, but that's what he does. You know, there were several times over the summer when it's a full moon out, and he just at dinner says... We should go for a sail around the island. And boom, at that moment, no matter what, the sailboats get rigged up. And all of a sudden, we're sailing around the island. And it's just that type of spirit where um, sometimes he encourages it and then wouldn't even join in himself just to be able to provide adventure and fun. So he was just trying to get you, <laughs> yeah, get get you out of the house. No, 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 really fun no, 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 no. went right around the island for a couple you know, hours. If I could get everybody out of my house for a couple hours, maybe I could talk to my wife. <laughs> with that, with that it's said. It's spirit so, of generosity and yes, fun I, I, and adventure. I, I'm and just poking awesome. fun. And, and we, we, Thank you for watching another epic story of success. If you like our message, please share Spartan Up with your friends and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you catch our show, maybe in the woods. Spartan Up is brought to you by Spartan Race. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com. 